Hey, Vince McMahon, it's time for this week's Stick to Wrestling podcast. <laughs> oh, no, give me a break. Oh, brother. I've seen rain, and I've listened to every episode of the Stick to Wrestling podcast. I want to thank James Taylor for writing and performing that song about his favorite podcast, Stick to Wrestling, where if you give us 60 minutes, perhaps indeed we'll give you a wicked good and raw bone podcast. I want my name is John McAdam. This is Stick to Wrestling. I want to invite you to join our Facebook group. Just get on Facebook, search Stick to Wrestling, and you will be allowed in as soon as I see it. It's a really good place. We talk about wrestling for the most part. I share photos. I share results. Other people talk about uh, different stuff, like who was the best heel in a movie or a television series. You get to talk about that stuff. So join the club. You are invited. I also want to invite you to follow me on Twitter. This does such good things for my ego. If you just search John McAdam and follow the guy who has the Stick to Wrestling logo as his avatar, you will be all set. I don't always stick to wrestling on that, but more certainly more than 50% of it is wrestling. But you might get a baseball tweet or two. You'll get through it. Uh, Let me see. Before I get rolling, I want to thank both John Ware and David Ferguson for their generous contributions to the Stick to Wrestling podcast. If you would like to donate to Stick to Wrestling, we don't do ads. We don't have commercials. It's a free podcast. This is the only way we see any cash. If you want to donate, you go to prowrestlingarchives at gmail.com and use PayPal for that. Before I started recording, I learned that there was some kind of controversy going on with PayPal. I didn't even have time to research it. My way of saying I don't care. All right. uh, Last week, Scott Cornish and I were going to discuss what led to the goings on Smoky Mountain Wrestling in the fall of 1992. And Scott and I started having so much fun talking about other stuff. And about 20 minutes into it, I just said, I just called kind of a timeout. And I said, Scott, let's just keep doing what we're doing. I'm having a lot of fun and we're having a good show. So I'm going to do what I planned on doing, but wouldn't do last week. And that is talk about Smoky Mountain Wrestling, fall of 1982, what led up to it. And then before the end of autumn, I will do a show where we talk about what went on fall of 1992 in Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Same way we talk about what went on in the WWF autumn of 1982. That one's coming up as well. Let's talk about what went into Smoky Mountain Wrestling. In 1991, we got wind that Jim Cornette had shot a pilot for his own wrestling promotion. And I mean, talk about getting excited. If there's anyone, if it, if it's fall of 1991, if there's anyone you want to hear about getting a promotion started, it's Jim Cornette. I mean, he knows the business, you know, from inside and out. He's really creative, as we've all seen, and he knows how to do things right. And I think personally, the first two years of Smoky Mountain Wrestling, everything was done pretty close to perfectly. And, you know, then slowly but surely, the promotion started dripping blood a little bit, meaning that, you know, little things got lost and people left and people, the right people didn't come in. And by the time the promotion ended Thanksgiving weekend, 1995. It wasn't very good anymore, but that doesn't matter. The first two or three years of Smoky Mountain were really good. Um, We talked a little bit last week about Smoky Mountain being in a time, kind of in a land that time forgot. And I think some people might've taken that the wrong way. I mean, I wouldn't want, I mean, I liked it enough so that I traveled from Massachusetts to Tennessee and Kentucky twice the years 1994 and 1995 to go visit those places and enjoy Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And guess what? I didn't want it to be exactly like Massachusetts. You know, you want to go someplace and have new experiences. I mentioned this on the group, I mean, the first time I was in Montreal, like I, you know, I was like, wow, I can't believe this place is only four hours from me because it's a completely different thing. 
And then the first time I visited Quebec City, I didn't think I was in another country. I thought I was on another planet, but I enjoyed it because it was different. So I don't want anyone to take what, what Scott and I were saying last week the wrong way. It, you know, it was different and we enjoyed it. As part of the group, I got a really interesting uh, note from Jonathan French that I want to share with you guys and very, really good analysis. He's like, uh, I love the show and I have yet to be disappointed with any Arcadian Vanguard offering, but there is one pet peeve with the offerings. Whenever there is a discussion about the Smoky Mountain territory, there are comments made about the backwardness of the area. And I think those comments actually contribute to a, a partial misunderstanding about why Smoky Mountain Wrestling ultimately failed. Just moving back a step, Jonathan grew up in southwest Virginia. So some... Quick background, Smoky Mountain ran congruently with the end of eighth grade through my first semester of my senior year in high school. I grew up in Abington, which you probably drove through on the way to Knoxville before entering uh, Chilhowie or the famous Saltville TV taping. I rarely missed a week of Smoky Mountain Wrestling TV, primarily because the action reminded me of JCP when I was younger. Yeah, it, same here. However, I never attended a show live. Wow. And the biggest reason was that the booking reflected the outside perception many have of Southwest Virginia. Reality was in the towns with the most money to spend, while the company, while the product was good wrestling, it didn't connect with many of us. At my high school, people were listening to Stone Temple Pilots, Nine Inch Nails, Snoop Dogg, and Oasis. Those of us watched but kept quiet. I know that feeling. We were memorized by Tammy or understood that the gangsters were pissed off. But kids who looked like Ricky Morton and, T and Tim Horner were kids that got picked on and mocked for being behind the times. And all of the f Confederate flag crap was embarrassing. And while Corny was struggling to get on TV in other markets, some of the biggest towns in his TV footprint never brought Smoky Mountain in, and Knoxville and Johnson City never brought in the crowds that they should. Why? Because Cornet booked for the way he perceived the fans, as backwards, caught in a time warp, and prone to react well to stuff that was, at best, distasteful. In doing so, he only captured a tiny portion of the potential audience in Knoxville and Johnson City, to the best of my knowledge, never booked a show in Bristol, uh, home of WCYB Channel 5, Smoky Mountains TV with the most powerful signal and stable time slot, those are important, or Kingsport, a more blue-collar city with a gigantic high school gym that regularly drew crowds of three or four thousand for Crockett shows seven years earlier. While the wrestling was good quality and some of the angles were tremendous, the man under the sheet with Arn Anderson, the build for the first bluegrass brawler, his favorites, the product was also insulting in a lot of ways. And all those people who watched occasionally enjoyed it but wouldn't buy tickets came out in droves during the Monday Night Wars when the product at least had a flavor that was a bit more relatable. I really appreciate Jonathan sharing this because it was a perspective I had never looked at before. I mean, Jim Corn, you know, the promotion catered to a certain fan. The fans came out to the buildings, and when I visited those buildings, I – I don't want to say wrongfully assumed I assumed that everyone was like that because I knew that not everyone in New England, uh, or put it this way, when we had wrestling on Saturday nights at the Boston Garden, that did not reflect what the rest of the population was like. But I really appreciate him sharing that, and I hope we all learned something from that. But anyway, getting back to what was coming into 1992, the announcers were Bob Coddle and Dutch Mantel. A better broadcasting pair you could not ask for. Bob Coddle is Bob Coddle. He's very straight, shoots it down the line. Dutch Mantel was kind of the heel persona in a way, but he wasn't over the top. He was funny. He was wisecracky. He was friendlier with the heels than he was with the baby faces, but he wasn't a total over the top heel. So I thought Dutch was fantastic, and he was a tremendous loss when they eventually lost him. I have always suspected that the whole point of Smoky Mountain Wrestling was this. A, Jim thought, Jim Cornette thought he could successfully promote 
in an area where there was a void, where people really missed real pro wrestling. WWF wasn't pro wrestling, the pro wrestling these people grew up with, and WCW started following the WWF's path. But I also suspect that one reason they were trying to get on, this is my grand theory, is that WTBS wanted wrestling because they wanted wrestling so badly, they bought a promotion and were running a promotion and were not doing a real good job doing so. And I believe the day may have come where Jim could have had a meeting with someone at TBS and said, look, if you guys want to just get out of the wrestling business but still have wrestling programming – I have a promotion. Here are the tapes. If you want an upgrade in, in production, we can talk about that. Put Smoky Mountain Wrestling on WTBS. I approached Brian Hildebrand with this theory in 1994. Uh, we were hanging out at his apartment, me, a couple of other people, and Brian, and I dropped that on him. And Brian gave me a look that was kind of like, John, shut up. John, shut up up so on, and that made me think even more that this maybe might have been a thing the tv itself it's an old time show it's with lots of squashes but it's way fast paced way more fast paced compared to the wwf or wcw of the early 90s obviously when the monday night wars took over you know they they put that at warp speed but it was a way it was the best tv product on in the united states and it wasn't even close ron wright is one of the lead heel managers here now ron wright is an old man he actually he wasn't even that old he was in his early 50s if you see what this guy looks like you are you you're gonna be like oh my god he is not 52 or 53 he's got to be in his mid 70s no he is in his early 50s he's in a wheelchair and so you would think a an old man in a wheelchair can't have him as a heel right Ron Wright says, try again. Can we please roll some audio for for review purposes of Ron Wright doing one of his earlier Smoky Mountain Wrestling interviews? All right, fans, before we go to the ring to see Hollywood Bob Holly in action, let's hear these words from a man who's been the center of a lot of controversy lately, Mr. Ron Wright. Wrestling fans, I'd like to share something with you. I'd like to read one of the thousands of letters that I've had in the last several weeks on this wrestling program. I want to read it to you. Dear Mr. Wright, I am writing you this letter to say that I have been a fan of yours for years. I know that you were one of the greatest and best-loved wrestlers ever, and I always liked how you showed them other wrestlers such good sportsmanship when they tried to maim and cripple you. I sure am sorry to hear how you need money for your operation. Please take this here $5 I am sending you. I wish it could be more for a kind old man like you. Maybe the other fans will write in and send money too until you can find a good Christian athlete to manage. You don't know what this does to me. This nearly breaks me down. It makes me feel good to know that these good fans have been a supporter of mine. They know I was a good Christian, clean, scientific wrestler for years, and I appreciate this from the bottom of my heart. That was great, in my opinion, because all of the baby faces, or especially Commissioner Bob Armstrong, we'll talk more about him in a minute, were just like, you know, you. they were just looking at the camera and say, you all know that Ron Wright is a con man, and you know that he wrestled as dirty as could be. But Ron had to be seen to be believed here. He has He's in a wheelchair, and he has a grandmotherly shawl covering his legs uh, again you would think this there's no way this is going to work but of course it works because it's smoky mountain wrestling and you've got jim Cornette and some really smart people uh running it speaking of which uh, bob armstrong is the smoky mountain wrestling commissioner and he did a phenomenal job in that role. He reminded you a lot of bill watts uh, when he was in mid-south and i don't think that was a coincidence but he was more like a – he was a Bill Watts kind of a – what's the name of the guy from the WWF? Jack Tunney. Thank you. Jack Tunney. He was a Jack Tunney type, unlike the 
commissioners over the last 20, 25 years in wrestling where they're the bad guys. And that makes absolutely no sense. But Bob Armstrong was absolutely phenomenal in his role as a Smoky Mountain commissioner. And now let's run a clip of Bob Armstrong in his duties as a commissioner. He is overseeing a signing for a match between the Fantastics, Jackie and Bobby Fulton, and the Heavenly Bodies, Stan Lane and Tom Pritchard. That's who the Heavenly Bodies were in 1992, along with Jim Cornette. This is taking place on a on a, a, a Roddy a Piper's Pit type show uh, known as Down and Dirty with Dutch Mantel. Mantel was even better than Piper was in his role. Let's take a listen now to the contract signing. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Down and Dirty with Dutch. I'm Dutch Mantel, and you're not. Today, we're gathered here for a monumental signing for the Smoky Mountain Tag Team Championship belts. Probably the most monumental signing in all of Smoky Mountain wrestling and possibly all of professional wrestling. Jimmy Cornette has put up $20,000 against the Fantastics, against the belt, and we are here to see if the signing will occur. Bobby Fulton, your comments on this match right now. Well, I'll tell you, anything, anytime I start thinking about the heavenly bodies, i got to say I'm thinking of low-life scum. And I told those guys right from the start in Cornette, you can tell your mama we were going to make you wait on a title shot. There was other teams. Well, I got this to say to you, $20,000 is a lot, but we'd whip on these guys for free, wouldn't we, Jackie? And let me tell you something. Put your money where your mouth is, punk. We'll sign the dotted line for 20 grand. Okay, Bob Armstrong, joining me right now, of course, the Heavenly Bodies, the Fantastic, and the Commissioner, Bob Armstrong. Bob Armstrong, your comments on this signing. Well, I've got this to say. I'm not going to take a check from Jimmy Carnett or his mother. Now, if they put cash in my hand, I'll take it to the Smoky Mountain Bank, and then we'll have this match as long as I get cash money. Hey, hey, cash let, money. Let, let, okay, me, Jimmy. let me say something. First of all, don't bring my mother into this. Sure, she's putting the money up, but she's the silent partner. And let me tell you something, Fulton, and you listen real good. You're going to choke on this 20 grand, brother, because I want one thing more. In addition to the titles being on the line, in addition to the 20 grand in cash being put up, I don't want, Mr. Armstrong, yeah. I don't want to leave my 20 grand on the whim of one of your 125-pound soaking wet referees around here that you control like a puppet that does everything that you say. I don't want the referee to decide where the 20 grand goes. I want the best men to win. So I want a no disqualification clause in that contract that states that there's no way that the referee can call that match off for any circumstances. Okay, Mr. Fulton, your comment, do you accept that? You want, you want to, let me tell you something right now, Cornette. I think we proved in that barbed wire match that we could beat you. Even though you didn't interfere bodily, there was either powder, my brother said, was thrown in his eyes. That tennis racket made it in the ring. Well, let me tell you something. Hold it. I want to just say something privately to Bob Armstrong. Hey, what is this? Hey, can they do this? Can they do this? Look at hey, this. What is this? It's conspiracy. Wait a minute. What's going on? I demand what's going on here. Just say Okay. Uh, Bobby Fulton agrees it should be a no DQ and the best man should win. There's no doubt about it. The best team should win win but uh, every time they have a match your tennis racket seems to find its way even even in a barbed wire match it's found its way into the ring so this time he pulled it in there not only will we have a, a time uh, no time limit no disqualification we'll have it on tv right here next week but Fine. your tennis racket will be omitted from the ring and the ring air. No way. Hey, let me tell you something. You counted the pin. You counted the pin for him. You gave him the belts. You set the... Yeah, you Wait, a stand up. Wait a minute, guys. You, never you know set the match up. If you don't sign it, there will be no match. Is that simple enough? You've done everything you can to get the belts on him. Now that they got him, you ain't going to let... Why don't you just pull a gun out and shoot us, Armstrong? You get over with, you yeah. poop. Sign it. Sign it, Jimmy. We'll take it. I don't care. You're gonna choke on that 20 grand and that contract. Santa Claus, good. good. Hey, good. Hey, okay, guys. Okay, fans, you saw it. Next week, right here on television, the Heavenly Bodies. Wait, wait a minute, guys. The Heavenly Bodies versus the Fantastic. Twenty thousand dollars on the line against the belts. Next week, stay tuned, fans. We'll be back in two minutes. All right, we took some questions on 1992 Smoky Mountain Wrestling on the Facebook group. John Ware asked. I've watched random episodes on YouTube, but I would like to watch chronologically. Any recommends on how to start? Yes, I do. I recommend it's watching a random episode of Smoky Mountain Wrestling to me is like watching a random episode of Breaking Bad or The Sopranos. You want to catch it from the beginning. I acknowledge that it tails off a little bit, 94, 95, but I mean, watch everything that's out there. If you just put in the word Smoky Mountain Wrestling 
in the YouTube search engine. It comes right up. The first four episodes are... No one has ha- I've had 30 years to find them. I've never seen them. Whoever posted these on YouTube does not have the first four episodes. They're missing one episode, episode number 20 after that. But I recommend watch them all. I mean, I think they're I think they're outstanding. I really do. The You know, it's it's comparable as a territory to Mid-South or Florida in terms of overall quality. Now that's a mouthful. Was the booking as good as Mid-South? It's right up there. Was the wrestling as good as Florida? No, but the booking was probably a little bit better. It was more fast paced. So I recommend once again, if, if, you know, just put in the word Smoky Mountain Wrestling and start from the beginning. But anyway, let's talk about a little bit about the segment that we just did. The Heavenly Bodies managed by Jim Cornette. Just lost the tag team champions championships to the Fantastics. They ev- eventually won them back, and they were champions coming into fall 1992. They did this gimmick. Stan Lane had had a, a hairpiece, and it was a hairpiece that would make Elvis blush. Because he was wrestling, this obviously hair pieces in wrestling don't always go together. So they did the old angle where Stan ha- Stan Lane is wearing a controversial headgear that both in real life in real life keeps the head the, the hair piece on, right? But they do an angle where they claim that the Fantastics did something to break Stan Lane's eardrums, one of his eardrums, and that Stan was very susceptible to noise. And they, the comedy was phenomenal. They'd go out there and, t- and Cornette would be screaming at the fans to shut up. You're going to hurt Stan Lane's ear. And, of course, they'd all start making noise. And Stan would hold his ear and act like he was in agony. <laughs> it, it's, I know it's very slapstick but I thought the whole thing was very funny. So coming into fall of 1992, the Heavenly Bodies and Fantastic Feud is still going on. Let me see. I'll take another question. Um, Pete Pingle, John, I missed your chance to ask questions. Oh, my question is, I have watched every episode and really liked it, but I didn't love it. It was missing something. I can't put my finger on it. Was it talent? Was it better TV production? I just can't put my finger on it. What do you think it was? Pete, I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, to me, this was by far the best wrestling promotion in the United States in the early 1990s, but... I think one thing that worked against Smoky Mountain is that as soon as uh, the WWF or WCW would grab one of their talents, which was inevitable, they would use them as either a mid-card or an undercard talent. Worst scenario was when the Heavenly Bodies went to the WWF, and at first they were kind of one of the top tag teams, but by the middle of 1994, they were losing a lot of matches, and these guys were you know, the kings of Smoky Mountain Wrestling, and when they got to the major leagues, the major leagues booked them to look bad. And I think that's one thing that, that worked against Smoky Mountain Wrestling. But fall of 90, 1992, what else is going on? We have a weekly down and dirty with Dutch segment that, again, very similar to Piper's Pit or the Brother Love Show. Uh, let's take a look at one of those. All right, and Dutch, right you are. Let's bring him over here. Here's Mr. Wonderful, Paul Orndorff fans. And Paul... We've been talking about the $10,000 bounty in Brian Lee. There's been a lot of speculation that Paul Orndorff may be behind that. He may be the one putting up the $10,000. Let's just get one thing straight. The whole Smoky Mountain Wrestling and everybody concerned, Bob, what's his name, Armstrong, the commissioner? Yeah, yeah. You know what it is? Because I got a face like Robert Redford, a body like Arnold Schwarzenegger, and a mind like Albert Einstein. They're all jealous. Every man sitting out there is jealous of Mr. Wonderful. And you call this the Mountain State? I ain't seen one mountain man yet. I've seen nothing but a bunch of babies, a bunch of sissies, and I'm sick and tired of it. Brian Lee, Ronnie Garvin, before it's all over and done with, I'm going to pile drive you, and it's going to be all over. I might even pile drive you. All right, fans, we'll be back. Let's take this time out. 
All right, I went out of order there. I apologize, but it makes sense. Paul Orndorff came to Smoky Mountain Wrestling, a big name uh, in, in pro wrestling. I mean, someone who headlined the first WrestleMania is now part of Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Uh, Paul had largely been out of wrestling on a, since early 1998 with uh, nerve damage to his arm. Uh, he lived in Atlanta, which is not far from the Smoky Mountains base, and he decided to start a comeback, which eventually led to him resurfacing in World Championship Wrestling. But he started off in Smoky Mountain Wrestling as a babyface. One day, he just went crazy and started pile driving all of the all of the other baby faces. Then he got into a feud with Ron Garvin. So here we have, you know, a former WWF superstar headlining WrestleMania against the former NWA champion Ron Garvin. To me, you know, this this is. The end, towards the end of his career, I believe this was the end of his career, but he was a perfect guy for a Smoky Mountain. I mean, he, everyone in Knoxville knew who Ron Garvin was. It was a funny feud. It started when Paul Orndorff desecrated one of the towels that Ronnie Garvin would throw into the audience. And Ron Garvin retaliated by stealing one of Paul Orndorff's robes. And after all, Orndorff stole one of his towels. And every week he would he would do something to the robe. He would first turn the robe into a jacket with a pair of scissors. Then the jacket became a vest. And Mr. Orndorff got angrier and angrier every single time. One thing Orndorff was talking about during that segment was... There was a there was a bounty placed on Brian Lee. Brian Lee was the top babyface in Smoky Mountain Wrestling. The first time I saw Brian Lee in Memphis, I'm like, wait a minute, we might have something here. He was a big, tall, good looking guy who you know looked like he had a future. And, and apparently, Jim Cornette saw what I saw because he brought Brian Lee in and made him the top babyface. He was feud had been feuding with Dirty White Boy coming into the fall of 1992, but then they started running an angle where there were wanted posters being all over the place for Brian Lee. I thought that was a very creative angle. You know, you'd walk into the people say they'd walk into the building and they would see these wanted signs. Anyone who could do something to Brian Lee, you're going to get ten thousand dollars to put him out of wrestling. And the question was. Who is behind this? And they say, you know, they asked Paul Orndorff just now, Paul, are you possibly behind it? Oh, no, not me. But we don't know. So let's let, now let's listen to a down and dirty with Dutch segment where he speaks with Brian Lee and Commissioner Bob Armstrong on this subject. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Down and Dirty with Dutch. I'm Dutch Mantel, and you're not. Today, my special guest on Down and Dirty, of course, is Commissioner of Smoky Mountain Wrestling, Bob Armstrong, and the most wanted man in America because of these posters that have been put all over the Smoky Mountain Wrestling area. Now, Bob Armstrong, I know you're very concerned about these posters because you don't know the man behind it. And I just wanted to tell you my personal opinion. Of course, I think it's reprehensible. And I've often said that men shouldn't do this, and I think you should get to the bottom of the problem. I'm on your side, and I've always been on your side. Now, I understand that a mystery man has written another letter, and he sent it to you, and... Can you can you reveal it on Down and Dirty with Dutch today? That's exactly right. That's why I came here, Dutch, is to read this letter to you that this sicko has written me. I can recognize the handwriting already. There's never a signature, but there's plenty of wanted posters around. I've got enough to wallpaper my house, and I'm sick of it, and Brian's sick of it. Listen to the letter. Commissioner Armstrong, you seem surprised that my follower keeps returning. All the police and all the security in the world cannot stop him from doing my will. My, you will regret having wronged me. All of wrestling will pay. You, Armstrong, will be forced to stand by and watch. You will be helpless to stop it. Brian Lee will be the first to suffer, but he won't be the last. Do not interfere with my errand boy or more of your friends will be hurt. Now, I've racked my brains to think of somebody in my past that would be this sick to do something like this, mm -hmm. and I can't think about it. People are on my back wanting a shot at Brian Lee for $10,000. Listen to this list. Dirty White Boy, Paul Orndorff, Killer Kyle, the Heavenly Bodies, and I've even had an offer from outside Smoky Mountain Wrestling for a $10,000 shot at him. And I'm going to tell you this. Call me. 
Let's talk about it. Let's have a meeting. Let's be face to face. Let's be standing up about it. Maybe we can solve the problem. And if I find out anybody in Smoky Mountain Wrestling right now is involved in this, they're going to be banned, and that is forever. I'm going to give this to you, Brian Lee. You do with it what you've done the rest of them. Well, first of all, let me, let me say this now. This is a, uh, an investigative uh, segment that I'm doing right here. Brian Lee, I would just like to ask you right now, are you, you know, to me, if somebody was doing this to me, you know, I'd have a little trouble sleeping at well, night. Now, wait, wait a minute. Can, can you sleep at night? Can you sleep at night? You're exactly right. I can sleep Are you night. nervous? Nervous is an understatement, but I'm going to do with this just what I've done with everyone else. It's like Bob Armstrong said, if the man will get in my face, it's much easier. You know, I'm having to look over my back. I'm having to watch every shadow on the wall. $10,000 is a lot of money. And I tell you what, $10,000 will make a man hurt a man. But the only thing that's going to happen is primetime Brian Lee's going to have to get tougher. And I'm going to get tougher start today. I'm going to take this poster you have, rip it up, and I'm going to rip everybody up that gets in my face. Well, there you heard it, fans. Bob Armstrong and Brian Lee. And Brian Lee, you can tear all the posters if you want to, but they have thousands floating around. Fans, don't go away. We'll be back in two minutes. Stay tuned. Shut up. I'm Dutch Mantel, and you're not. It cracked me up every single time I heard it. And what a great heel. Bob, I'm on your side. I've always been on your side. This is one reason I've told the story before. I used to have someone in Johnson City uh, mail me the uh, Tim Whitehurst is, was his name. He would, uh, Tim Whitehead, excuse me, would mail me every four weeks uh, four episodes of Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And I, I would be a self-parody. I'd be like, all right, you know, the package would arrive. I would look forward to it. And it, I would say, okay, I'm not going to watch every episode tonight. I know I can't just watch one, but I'll only watch two. I'll save the other two. I'll savor them. And then by the end of the second episode, I'd be like, all right, I'll watch three episodes because I want to see what happened with this angle that they've got going on. And of course, by the end of the night, all four episodes had been consumed, happened every single time. I would tell myself, no, this time you're only going to watch two episodes. And I just never learned all that. I guess I did eventually. But once again, very similar to a Piper's Pit segment or a Brother Love segment where you have a personality reviewing various angles that are going on in the in the promotion. I thought that was a great angle. Brian Lee has a stalker and we don't know who it is, but we will soon find out on Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Jamie Ward asks, who was a better referee, Mark Curtis or Tommy Young? I'm going to take Mark Curtis every single time. And I loved Tommy Young, but no one took being a referee more serious than Brian Hildebrand slash Mark Curtis. No one was more dedicated to the business. No one wanted it more than he did. I mean, I remember, you know, just hanging out with Mark. He he was a referee. Yeah, you know, every single night for Smoky Mountain Wrestling, I don't think they had a second referee. He did various stuff for Jim Cornette. He was kind of Jim Cornette. He was definitely Jim Cornette's lieutenant. And on top of all that, he worked a side job at a shoe store making ends meet. That is dedication. The guy totally revamped his life, moved from Pittsburgh to Morristown, Tennessee. And, I mean, I remember... I remember Brian was was devastated when Smoky Mountain Wrestling ended in 1995, and he tried to talk Jim Cornette into just giving it a little more time, and, and Jim just felt like it's not going to work. But we've been at this for four years, and it's not going to work. And I give Jim Cornette a lot of credit for that because he did have a, a legitimate person who had money and was willing to keep Smoky Mountain Wrestling going, and, and Jim just didn't want him to burn through the money, quite frankly. Anyway, what else is going on fall 1992? We had a match on TV between Robert Gibson, who had been wrestling as a single in Smoky Mountain Wrestling for the last few months, against uh, Jimmy Golden on TV, and Robert Fuller ran in and made an absolute mess out of Robert Gibson. Two on one. Well, what's Robert Gibson going to do? Robert has a plan. Let's hear what that plan is. Right now, the Gibson is taking. Somebody needs to help the guy, Dutch. How about going up there and Nobody stop Nobody can help if me. If Golden's your friend, get up there and stop this. Why should I stop it? Golden is my friend. 
Robert Gibson came in unannounced, uninvited, and tried to attack Jimmy Golden. Golden. From the back, I might add. A backbiter. He's a backbiter. And you know why nobody's having Robert Gibson? He has no friends, probably. Fans, here's rock and roll Robert Gibson. Robert, last week the fans saw, and we all looked at it in horror, as you really were jumped, really had a ton of trouble with Jimmy Golden and Robert Fuller. Fuller just came out of nowhere, and I know you've been looking for a tag team partner. You got some news for all the fans. That's right, Bob. See, I had Jimmy, Jimmy Golden right where I wanted him, but what happened, he got called an old friend up, Robert Fuller. Robert Fuller comes out. He wants to jump with me, too. Let me tell you something, Robert Fuller. I got old friends, too, and I made a phone call to somebody I haven't talked to in over a year. He told me I'd be glad to be there and be beside your side. Let me tell you something, guys, and this is what he said. You know, I've made a lot of mistakes in my life, like everybody else has. But you see, I was in a situation where I've lost everything in my life. Anything that ever meant anything to me, I lost it. When that happened, I turned against friends. I turned against family. But one thing was for sure, when family fights, it's all right. But nobody else interferes. That's why I got old to you, Robert Fuller and Jimmy Golden. Because one thing you've done is you got the Rock and Roll Express back together. Because I don't care what it takes, brother. You do not lay a hand on Robert Gibson. Myself, I think it's all right. But you see, I'm in a situation now well, I told you, I lost everything I had, and I know it was a big mistake. I even come out here and told everybody in the world that I never even signed another autograph. I was wrong, because at the time, I got offered a big contract, money. Money supposed to make the difference in my life, but money made nothing, because I had nobody to stand behind me like all the fans that used to. But one thing I know for sure is, that myself and Robert Gibson were four times world tag team champions. Nobody's ever come close to that record. Nobody's even come close to our win and, our win and loss record. So be sure on that. But one thing is for certain, Robert Fuller and Jimmy Golden, the Rock and Roll Express is going to reunite, and we're going to reunite with you. So we don't care what it takes. Like I told you before, we're the best tag team in the world today. And Robert Gibson, you know, and I hope you do, brother, that I'll stand beside you through thick and thin. I'll be there when the doors open. All right, fans, and with us right now, Robert Fuller, Jimmy Golden, after what you guys did last week to Robert Gibson, how do you take that news right there from Robert? I'm going to tell you something. I don't know where to stand out here and gripe or laugh and be happy. I'm going to tell you one thing about Ricky Morton. It ain't been a year ago in Knoxville, Tennessee, Robert Gibson, that he put you on your butt. Boy, he kicked your eye in real good. You want to call him a partner? I'm going to tell you, so you picked him real good. First of all, he's got no business bringing anybody in here from another organization from way down there in Atlanta, Georgia, or somewhere. He's not got the right, he's not got guts enough to step in a ring with me alone. What's the matter with you, Gibson? You got no guts, huh, boy? Reuniting the Rock and Roll Express. No, That's hey, what happened. Hey, let's don't go that far. Let's talk about reuniting the stud stable of Jimmy Golden and Robert Fuller. Just let me clear one thing. I know thing. what the rules are here, right. Bob. I'm so they're not going to let that boy step out of one organization and into another and wrestle when he don't even have no license to wrestle here. Well, I don't care what they do, Robert. I don't care what they do. But what I'm going to do is let Ricky Martin come in here and the Rock and Roll Express will roll again. For what? How come you think you can do that? Who do you think you are, Bob Strong? Just because you say you're a commissioner around here, you got the right to come out here and tell us who we got to wrestle. I don't have to wrestle nobody that I don't feel like wrestling. What you gonna do, Armstrong? I'm gonna tell you. You're gonna sign his death warrant. You're talking about killing somebody. That boy's gonna get hurt. There ain't gonna be no room for you at the Keebler factory for that elf, son. You're gonna be ours. All right, fans. We'll be back right after we take time out for this message. Great heel stuff. Jimmy Golden saying that the commissioner of Smoky Mountain Wrestling can't tell him who to wrestle just because he's the commissioner. That is great heel stuff. When I heard that the Rock and Roll Express were reuniting and that Smoky Mountain Wrestling was going to feature them heavily, I thought they were nuts. I thought they were absolutely crazy. The Rock and Roll Express was something that had been, I mean, finished for close to five years they had split up ricky morton was floundering in wcw before he came in robert gibson was wrestling indies and i was like you know these guys are just plain out of style that hair you know cut it all off two years ago i did at least and you know and it worked jim Cornette was right it was the right tag team for the right place the size difference between Robert Fuller and Jimmy Golden and the Rock and Roll Express, just for those who don't know, Jim, Jimmy Golden and Robert Fuller are big guys. They are legit, at least six, 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 seven apiece. And the Rock and Roll Express were smaller. 
And no one thought anything of it because it's the Rock and Roll Express. Everyone accepts that they're a great tag team. It, it felt like, to me, the only per- people who worried about stuff like that were people like Bill Watts, people like Vince McMahon. You know, the wrestling fans tend to forget about that size differential if the wrestler is over enough. Also want to throw in... I mean, it would be a my. It was a minor miracle to get me to like anything associated with Robert Fuller in 1992. Robert Fuller, he had his strengths, but he had his weaknesses. And when he was the Booker in Memphis, Memphis was at his at its worst. This was 1988. We talked about it last week. Robert Fuller would would do like literally four or five interviews in one. 90 minute show. He was connected to every heel on that side of the roster. And then in 92, he was in Memphis teaming with Jeff Jarrett. And I grew to like him in that role because one thing I didn't like about Robert Fuller was his interviews tended to have one speed. He would just get on the mic and yell and be obnoxious. And that's all he could do. And both in Memphis in 92 and Smoky Mountain in 92, he kind of got off that. He he changed gears a little bit. I think sometimes you have to do that in wrestling. Um, all right, before we go to the next audio, let me take another question um, from Matt Mann. How over were the other fantastic combo over, compared to the original pairing and what undercard act do you think should have gotten a push i think the fantastics did really well in smoky mountain wrestling i jackie fulton was definitely a downgrade from tommy rogers sorry jackie but tommy rogers was excellent but you know what jim Cornette couldn't get tommy rogers he was wrestling part-time in japan he did come in eventually to smoky mountain wrestling but you know, you, you took what he took what he could get, and as the first big feud in Smoky Mountain wrestling history, the new heavenly bodies against the new Fantastics. I mean, it got over quite well, and it was a really good feud. Okay, so the next audio. Let's see. One thing they did in every episode of Smoky Mountain wrestling, they ran this plug. To have Smoky Mountain Wrestling come to your town to use it as a fundraiser. And this was, it was so perfect. Let's hear that now. If you'd like to raise money for your school, club, or civic organization, and you'd like to see the excitement of Smoky Mountain Wrestling live in your hometown, this message is for you. High school and college athletic departments, sports teams, police and fire departments, JCs, civic groups, or any group wishing to raise money can bring the stars of Smoky Mountain Wrestling to town for a night of action and receive a portion of the receipt. Write to us. Our call is Sandy Scott at 703-989-6819. Smoky Mountain Wrestling and your civic group, an unbeatable tag team. That was perfect. How perfect was that? When I was running a promotion, I stole that word for word. Smoky Mountain Wrestling and your civic group, an unbeatable tag team combination. I mean, I, I, I'm genuinely curious to see how many phone calls Sandy Scott got on that, how successful it was. But I do know they ran spot shows and sold shows. So again, just absolutely perfect. They did it every week and I listened to it every week. Now, one person who, I mean, Jim Cornette was probably my favorite person in wrestling <laughs> right around this time, 30 years ago. You know, Jim was so smart, so ambitious. Dishes. He got this thing off the ground from scratch. And can you imagine Jim Cornette having at least an entire year to put together his ideas of what he wanted a wrestling group to be? Let's just hear a an interview from someone I thought was the best interview in wrestling in the late 80s and early 90s, Jim Cornette. Fans, in hey, two hey, weeks, hey. it's a big tag team tournament. Jim Cornette, hey, minute, what is the big mis- mystery about the team? First of all, if you look over here at the front row, they've decided to remake Deliverance with the original cast. I want you people to shut up while I'm doing something out here. Let me tell you something. Mr. Stick his nose at everybody's business, Armstrong. He assaults a cripple over here. He tells me, shut up. He tells me, Jim Cornette. It's not fair for you to have a mystery team in a tournament. It's not fair for all the other teams not to know who it is. But let me tell you something. If I was to reveal the identity of my tag team, then every single man in this part of the country would hang his head in shame, move out of the area. It would create financial upheaval, socioeconomic calamity. The whole area, the whole way of life as we know it would be thrown into disrepair. And as far as the tournament goes... 
Smoky Mountain Tag Team Tournament would be decimated. Every wrestler would be diving out of it. They'd be so scared. But I will say one thing. My team is sexier than Madonna's last video, built better than a bomb shelter, and more dangerous than a dinner party at Jeffrey Dahmer's place. And they will be the tag team champions. Good luck, Rip. More dangerous than a dinner at Jeffrey Dahmer's place. Little pop culture from 1992 there. And yes, uh, this tag team Jim Cornette is bringing in would cause socioeconomic calamity. One of the great, greatest interviews, one of the greatest interviews of in wrestling of all time. I didn't even finish Matt's question. Uh, what undercard act do you think should have gotten the push in Smoky Mountain Wrestling? I mean, Rip Rogers was fantastic in the ring uh, when he was with WCW as an undercard guy. You know, every time he was on TV, he had the best match of the program. And now he's in Smoky Mountain Wrestling. I, I don't think Rip Rogers had the look or the personality to be a big star in a WWF or WCW, but in Smoky Mountain Wrestling, I think he should have at least been at least a mid-card guy, and it just didn't happen for him. He was there early on and quickly left. I don't know what happened. Um, But anyway, Aaron Minnick asked, how involved was Rick Rubin? I largely knew Rick Rubin was a behind the scenes guy, although Jim Cornette told a story once about Rick Rubin getting a tape of Smoky Mountain Wrestling and contacting Jim Cornette and says, why is this Tim Horner guy singing on my on your television show? Um, But other than that, I think Rick Rubin and I, I don't know, I'm speculating here, but I think he was more behind the scenes than anything. Um. Rob Black Bear asks, would Ric Flair has, have worked as the champion or main event guy who only made big show appearances, or was WCW better for him? I personally am a little bit surprised that Jim Cornette and Smoky Mountain Rest, and WCW, excuse me, never worked something out where they could have at least borrowed Ric Flair for one big show because WCW wasn't running every night and just come to an agreement where Ric Flair comes in and does a Broadway with Brian Lee or Tracy Smothers or whoever else. Um, once again, I, I'm, I don't know if Jim Cornette ever contacted them. I don't know if Jim Cornette was interested. I don't know if WCW have, would have wanted to do something like that because obviously Jim Cornette didn't have the best relationship with uh, Jim Hurd. He didn't have a great relationship with Eric Bischoff. And when Bill Watts was in Smoky Mount or in, excuse me, running WCW, Ric Flair was not with that company. But it would have been an interesting concept to have Ric Flair, you know, come in for one of the really big shows, you know, Legend, Night of Legends, whatever else it would have been. Mark Matsu, were there any wrestlers not in WCW or the WWF at the time who you would have liked seeing in Smoky Mountain Wrestling? Well, yeah, there's a couple. Eddie Gilbert was conspicuous by his absence when Smoky Mountain Wrestling first started. It, 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 he seemed tailor-made for it, and it seemed tailor-made for him. And I asked uh, Brian Hildebrand once, you know, why, why isn't Eddie Gilbert here? And Brian just kind of said, well, Eddie and Jim are a little bit too alike. And, ah, all right, I could see that. But then uh, Eddie Gilbert eventually made it to Smoky Mountain Wrestling, and he was quickly gone. He got uh, Eddie got an offer to a book in Puerto Rico, and he split Smoky Mountain almost right away. And it felt like it was a mistake bringing him in. And it also felt like Brian kind of talked Jim Cornette into giving Eddie a shot. And as soon as Eddie got the shot, he blew it, which was always kind of sad because Eddie, you know, I was going to say Eddie was a really talented guy. But by the time he got to Smoky Mountain, I mean, really, something was missing. Uh, I don't know. It really felt like Eddie had gotten burned out of the wrestling business, which was his childhood dream. But that's, again, that's what it appeared like to me that Eddie was just burned out from the whole thing. Another guy who would have been a natural in Smoky Mountain Wrestling and did get a, get a couple of shots in there was Bobby Eaton. 
And, you know, obviously you have a on-screen and real-life connection between Jim Cornette and Bobby Eaton. And the reality was Bobby Eaton was under contract to WCW the entire time that Smoky Mountain Wrestling was was in existence. And in Jim Cornette's words, Bobby Eaton's job was to walk to his mailbox every two weeks and grab a check. And because WCW was only using him literally four, five, six times a month, that's about how many times a week he'd be on the road with Smoky Mountain Wrestling. So as much as we all, you know, dreamed of Bobby Eaton walking into the offices of WCW and saying, Dad, gummit, I want to live my dream of wrestling in Smoky Mountain Wrestling and have fun. And we all would have loved having him on screen. Bobby Eaton had a great job that he just wasn't going to give up to be part of Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And finally, Paul Hillman asks, do you think Dutch Mantel would have been better served in the ring, although his segments were good? I thought they used Dutch Mantel perfectly. Dutch, I have the highest opinion of Dutch Mantel. Instead of having him on doing one match every week and then doing an interview every week. He was on camera, not on camera, but his voice was on camera the entire time. And they had the down and dirty with Dutch segment. He did a great job doing commentary with uh, Bob Cottle. And I think if, if, if they had put him also made him a wrestler, they would have overexposed him. He was part of a feud coming up that we'll be talking about with um, it was a, a few where Bobby Eaton joined the heavenly bodies. So now there's three heavenly bodies. Uh, Jimmy Golden and Robert Fuller were teaming with Dutch Mantell and the Rock and Roll Express unexpectedly brought in Arn Anderson as their tag team partner. And they had a wild three way nine man tag team match. We'll talk about that when that comes up. Uh, let me see. So we are kind of transitioning coming into the fall of 1992. A lot of the feuds were winding down and which is good because now we're going to have fresh feuds coming into fall of 1992. Uh, with that, let's hear another interview from Jim Cornette. Wrestling fans, remember for the best in action and excitement, be sure you watch each week right here on this station for Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Wrestling the way it used to be, wrestling the way you like it. A number of outstanding stars, and we'll be letting you meet one of them in just a moment. In addition, we also have tremendous and great managers. One of them right here, Jim are, Cornette. Are you trying to insinuate I'm not a tremendous and great star? We'll meet one of them in a minute, but first here's Jim Cornette. Let me tell you something. You know, you know we're coming back with live professional wrestling in all the towns in the Smoky Mountain Wrestling area. You know what that's like? An albatross. That's a big, ugly bird that hangs around your neck, bringing doom and destruction everywhere it goes. That's what going to these redneck hillbilly towns is to me, an albatross. I'm calling Bob Armstrong. I ain't going to these stinking towns. Wrestling the way it used to be and wrestling the way you like it. I loved that. Obviously, I am a big fan of Smoky Mountain Wrestling, and we will have the review of the autumn of 1992 of Smoky Mountain Wrestling coming your way i want to remind everyone that anytime we use audio on stick to wrestling we're using it for educational and review purposes only i'm you'll be hearing a lot of that during the uh, smoky mountain wrestling shows again they're going to be very similar to our wwf 19 19- 82 review shows and with that i want to wrap up the show with another great segment from jim Cornette. once again something i stole this one i didn't steal word for word for for but i i stole plenty of it while i was promoting because i absolutely loved this interview uh we're gonna roll it but before we do that i want to thank everyone for listening to stick to wrestling this week uh we'll be back next week we plan on doing that wwf 1992 1982 uh, autumn review and i want to thank lou kippelman for all the great work he does producing this show i want to thank brian last for giving us this forum and once again thank everyone for listening this has been a presentation of the arcadian vanguard podcast network go vols please look decent against alabama and we'll close out by hearing one more time from jim Cornette. Great news for all you wrestling fans. Live professional wrestling, Smoky Mountain Wrestling, will be coming to your area very soon. You've been asking for it, you've been wanting it, and Smoky Mountain Wrestling is going to deliver it. And one of the guys that's going to be kicking up a lot of dust, no doubt about that, the Louisville slugger himself, Jim Cornette. Yeah, all the dust is going to come out of your pocket. That's how often you reach in that wallet. You know, all over the area... 
They're making plans to come see Smoky Mountain Wrestling over there in Tennessee. They're taking a couple of swigs of that white light and that moonshine, uh, taking in a few deposit bottles, get some pocket change, come out and see it. Over there in West Virginia, they're coming up out of holes in the ground, belching out some coal dust. Hey, take a swig of that Formula 44 to keep that black lung down, come out and see some wrestling all over the place. Everybody wants to see professional wrestling again. They don't want to see a circus. They don't want to see a sideshow. They want to see somebody get in there and fight and scratch and kick and gouge. And the only way they're going to win that match is if they got more guts in their belly than the guy they're standing across the ring from. Well, that's exactly what's going to happen with Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And when my tag team comes to town, brother, and they'll be revealed real soon, you can be assured of one thing and one thing only. Jim Cornette gets his way. When I tell you something's going to happen, brother, it's going to happen. If I tell you the sun ain't going to come up tomorrow, you better go out and buy you a flashlight. And I'm saying my tag team is going to reign supreme in Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Oh, you rednecks, you hillbillies, you genetic defects, come on out and take a look at it. Fans, Smoky Mountain Wrestling is wrestling the way it used to be and the way you like it. Be sure to look for it.